This is Mountain Landscape with Rainbow by German Romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich. In this painting, Friedrich presents a radical division in nature. A hiker in the foreground is stopped to rest against a mossy stone. From behind the viewer, the sun breaks through the clouds to illuminate the figure on his hill and shimmer through a distant rain to create a rainbow. This rainbow hanging above the darkness of the mountains is like a blessing upon the traveler, a benevolent guarantee of safety. A common interpretation of this painting suggests that the rainbow echoes that in the biblical account of the flood, wherein the rainbow represents a covenant between God and man. Follow God's law, and the world will not be destroyed again. But there are not many clues in the painting about the identity of this figure that suggests the concepts of sin or biblical law. If Friedrich is depicting a covenant, then it is of a much different kind and represents Friedrich's individual values rather than those of the Bible. Now, Friedrich was a deeply religious man, but his religion was personal, highly philosophical, and was oriented around the status of the human being in nature, and nature as an expression of the divine. While the familiar symbolism of the rainbow representing God's benevolence is not irrelevant to the painting, Friedrich was no mere symbolist or illustrator. He intended his compositions to function as original visual abstractions, and the themes are derived exclusively from the visual content contained in them, not from literary sources of which they are illustrations. So let's enter this painting with the mindset that everything we see is meaningful and intended to contribute to a thought made manifest in the picture. Our goal will be to recreate that thought inside our own minds. Notice that the rainbow is unlike any you have seen before. With only the mildest suggestion of the chromatic bands typical of a rainbow, it is depicted primarily as an opaque white. Now, Allow yourself to imagine this white band as the glinting reflection at the rounded edge of a bubble. This bubble extends outward from the perspective of the traveler and demarcates a change in the stylistic treatment of the sky above and below its edge. The world inside the bubble is the limited domain of human reason. The world outside represents the unknown, the inconceivable, the transcendent. In this context, the whiteness of the rainbow can be understood as the brilliance of supernatural light, too blinding even for color. Now what we've just done with our eyes is something special. We've allowed our eyes to focus on the painting in a different way. When we first looked at the painting, it was from the aspect of background and foreground. We are now seeing it from the aspect of above and below. And whereas before we were seeing this strip of light as an entity unto itself, as a rainbow, we're now seeing it as the attribute of another entity, a dome or bubble that sits over and around the traveler. The ability of our eyes to change context like this is what makes possible a double image, where we can find two distinct images built from the same components, such as a still life that is also a face a rock formation that is also a human figure, a human figure that is also a hand. Whereas in many paintings the double image is used as a gimmick or visual magic trick, Friedrich uses it in a more sophisticated way. By arranging his objects in a way that their meaning can be transformed from one context to another, Friedrich can pull more out of them and add a deeper dimension to his paintings, both visually and thematically. This requires participation on the part of the viewer, but it doesn't make the meaning of the painting subjective. It doesn't mean that anyone can see in it whatever they want. The meaning is limited by the actions possible to the viewer's eyes, and these are circumscribed by the painter. Now, different people will see different things, but rather than being evidence of subjectivity, it's merely an opportunity for us to learn from each other and to see more than what we saw before. This double image approach is a common motif in Friedrich's work, 
and it generally takes the form of a sequence of double images that allow him to produce multiple perspectives on a single subject and thus engage in a kind of self-dialogue where each perspective leads to the next and comments on the last. The rainbow viewed in a physical context is just that, a simple rainbow. In a deeper context, it becomes a symbol of man's relationship with God. Now, in a still deeper context, it becomes a visual embodiment of the complex philosophical idea of a divided world, one which is knowable and one which is not. Friedrich produces this division of worlds by altering his stylistic depiction of the cloud bank above and below the line of the rainbow. The most striking juxtaposition is the unnatural darkness of the mountains directly beneath the rainbow. Though the moon illuminates the sky above, its light is unable to penetrate to the mountains. Above the rainbow, the clouds morph and stretch to form a violent phantasmagoria of claws, talons, menacing anthropoid faces, ghostly arms reaching out and grasping nothing. Fortunately, there is a reprieve from the chaos of this depiction, where the long cloud in the upper left transects the moonbeams, the two together form the image of an eye. By means of this sternly aloof eye, Friedrich suggests a cosmic intelligence. Now let's look at the lower world. Precisely at the line of the rainbow, the clouds become smoother, like a sheet being pulled taut. But impressed into the sheet are images from the upper world. See the terrifying face in the distance? This shows us God as a wrathful rainmaker. The dark mountain in the center is a kind of impenetrable monolith, striking fear by its very size and distance. This ominous distance is contrasted with the more serene foreground. And this contrast of opposites, of good and bad, is repeated in the foreground with the double images seen in the foliage on either side of the traveler. Behind him, the leaves loom up into a giant monster, ready to fall on the traveler's head. But he need not fear, because on his other side, a giant dragon, or lion, lies in repose on the hillside its position suggesting that of a submissive dog, its chin resting on the grass, and its paws on either side of its head. You see, this is the head. Here are its eyes, with a void to suggest nostrils, and this line to suggest its mouth. Here is its right paw, and here is its left and the benign expression on its face suggests a loyal protector. It's elements like this that save the work from pessimism. Friedrich is showing us a balance that exists in nature, and suggesting through these animal images that that same balance exists within the human soul, two sides of our nature, good and bad. And here is where I think we can find the real meaning of the covenant represented by the rainbow. A rainbow can only be seen during a rainstorm when the sun has emerged from behind the clouds. A rainbow is a meeting point between light and dark, the fulcrum of a scale upon which light and dark are balanced. Man, Friedrich believes, is this same type of fulcrum, a representative of nature that balances its best and worst elements. It is more of a covenant with one's own self. A recognition that the balance of our souls reflects the same balance that exists in nature. Quoting Friedrich, Man stands in equal proximity and equal distance to both God and the devil. He is the highest and lowest of creatures, the most noble and the most degenerate, the embodiment of all that is good and beautiful and of all that is despicable and accursed. Now, this is the moral meaning of the painting, but Friedrich rests his morality on a metaphysics and an epistemology. Metaphysics being a view of the world, and epistemology being a view of human knowledge. Both of these are going to be presented to us in the painting.
we've seen that Friedrich presents the human world in this little scene here as mirroring the elements that make up the cosmos. And the cosmos itself as mirroring a heavenly dimension. Friedrich is expressing his pantheism, the view that God is immanent in nature, and the two cannot be strictly distinguished from each other. Speaking of his swans in the reeds, it is claimed that Friedrich said, The divine is everywhere, even in a grain of sand. There I represented it in the reeds. I was not able to find a primary source for this quote, but I do know that Friedrich wrote in 1830 that the noble person recognizes God in everything. And we see two faces of God in this painting, his wrathful face and his benevolent one. And these two poles are repeated everywhere. And so we see a metaphysics made of this balance, a balance even between the supernatural and the natural, with the human being at the center of it all looking out. What does he see? What does Friedrich think about human knowledge? How do we know what we know? Well, notice that though the traveler is actually illuminated by the sun, which is behind us, the viewer, he looks out towards the moon. And the position of the moon relative to the rainbow creates a rhythm of highlights moving from background to foreground, from the moon to the rainbow to the traveler. The three together form a line diagonally transecting the composition and from this arises the illusion that the figure is illuminated by the moon. It is as though the light of the cosmic intelligence illuminates the traveler's world. And as the light penetrates the bubble, it creates the reflection along the rounded edge. And so what had been a world apart from us becomes that which illuminates our world. Friedrich is expressing his belief in revelation the idea that knowledge comes from a divine source. But Friedrich is a pantheist. We see God not through prayer, but through perception, by simply looking at the world around us. We don't find it in a temple. We find it in nature. In this respect, far from being a typical religious mystic, Friedrich is more of a naturalist embracing a this-worldly attitude. And this is a conflict in Friedrich. In many of his paintings, we see him leaning into a contemplation of death and even a kind of worship of this forlorn, mystical, world-weary viewpoint. But I think that this is actually in conflict with his basic artistic method. Friedrich is a preeminent observer of the natural world. His paintings are constructed from a vast catalog of drawings that he made while wandering through nature. And these drawings reveal a precision that is almost scientific. When making his oil paintings, he takes these drawings, these raw naturalistic elements, and pulls them together. Like a chemist in a laboratory, he isolates a new element never seen before. Friedrich himself remarked on this, saying, Art occupies the role of mediator between nature and man. The original is too great and too sublime for the majority to be able to grasp it. I would say, personally, thank God that Friedrich was able to be such a mediator. That through his penetrating vision, we were able to see a world that was possible only through him. A vision which, despite its more mystical elements, sometimes expresses a more optimistic view of human knowledge, one that places confidence in human reason. Now, to convince you that this part of Friedrich really does exist and isn't just my own projection, I want to take you through one last sequence of double images, a sequence that integrates all the aspects we have discussed so far and turns the design structure of the painting itself, that of this division of the above and below into a double image, one that actually defies the original meaning of that structure. So I'll ask you to put yourself in the perspective of the little man on the hill. Lean back into the stone, 
and allow yourself to rest from your long journey. Feel the soft moss under your fingers. Feel the cool breeze coming from the mountains and the warm touch of the sun on your neck. You look up at the dome of the sky above you. But the sky is not something external to you. It is rather your own mind lifting up into the clouds. Now see what had been a rainbow, what had been a bubble, what had been an impenetrable barrier, now become an eye. This is not the eye of heaven looking down, but a grand-scale symbolic projection of sense perception, embodied as an eyeball looking upward. The black mountain is its pupil, the clouds its glittering iris. A small, soft light in the greatest distance seems to emanate from the mountain's peak, lift up and spread out against the inside edge of the eye. It then penetrates out into the sky above, as though through a keyhole in the cloud bank. What had been the source of illumination is now the light of man's mind penetrating into the deepest mysteries of existence. But the sequence doesn't end there. The eye contains within it two more double images, a bow being pulled taut, its arrow pointed upward. Then the bow becomes the wings of a bird, the clouds its dappled feathers. This vastly complex, slowly derived, and deeply personal visual metaphor is Friedrich's ultimate epistemological assertion. I do perceive the world, he seems to demand. However dimly, however briefly, my mind does penetrate. And it is by the act of perception that I ascend spiritually. The direction of the eye, in conjunction with the sense that it is rising upward out of the earth, produces a sense that the earth is like an enormous body lying on its back. The connotation of this body being relaxed is produced by the casually relaxed pose of the traveler. The eyes stare up from this body into the universe, and somehow the torture of what had been a metaphysical division dissolves. This body luxuriates into itself. So does the traveler. And in this we come to the widest emotional projection of the work. By the sense of a luxuriating consciousness, Friedrich presents an image of man at home in his world. While his knowledge may be limited and the darkness seeming to never end, let him be granted a single ray of light and a quiet rock on which to rest, and he can find solace in this world. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. If you did, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell so that you'll be notified about my next video. Thanks.